now can people see my shared uh, that's, that's perfect at this of point title, title, okay that's hopeful right so um uh, I'm going to address a very, very different topic from what Larry was talking about. I'm not talking about Bayesian estimation at all. I'm talking about Bayesian decision theory. Um, and I want really to go into the foundations of uh, causal inference and understand how do we set up a framework in which we can sensibly talk about what we want to do. Now, there are various frameworks around. Um, uh, very popular, and Larry mentioned, is the framework of potential outcomes. Uh, graphical models are fundamental, everybody will think. Um, structural causal models. Um, it's often been said, and I think Larry said, that these are essentially equivalent. I actually don't believe that. I think there are important differences between them, which for many purposes uh, don't show themselves um, and then you do can regard them as equivalent but but we do actually find for some problems and it really does matter what framework you're going to use so my framework is based on bayesian statistical decision theory and uh, naturally i believe that it's the right framework uh, and the other frameworks uh, based for example on potential outcomes are just really too complicated and potentially misleading. So I want to try and uh, convince you that really all you need for understanding statistical causality is good old Bayesian statistical decision theory, uh, developed a little in order to make proper use of available information. So I'm going to go right back to basics, the very first statistics course you ever had, and uh, not very long into that, you would have discussed the two sample experiment where we have uh, two, uh, we, we, we sample from a, a relevant population, N0 individuals uh, and uh, who will have one treatment, let's say um, chalk tablets and N1 individuals who will have some other treatment, um, perhaps aspirin, uh, to see if these headache sufferers will improve if they're given one treatment or the other. Um, so there's an inactive control, chalk C or zero, um, and the N zeros get randomly assigned to that, and then we get uh, their responses. Um, I'm going through this ridiculously slowly because you all know about this. This is the simple two, two sample test. Uh, and so let's, let's call the response the log duration of the headache. Uh, I, that's not important, but let's have it both positive and negative so I can make it normal. Um, and then the remaining individuals uh, have been randomly assigned to the active treatment, aspirin, called T or 1. Um, and we got their responses. Uh, and uh, at this very early stage of uh, statistical learning, we all assume everything is normal. So the YIJs are all independent. They have uh, a distribution which depends on I, namely which group they're in, which treatment they've got. And we'll give them uh, a mean mu I, which will depend on that treatment. And uh, we'll, uh, for simplicity, a common variance. This is just making things as easy as they can be. Okay, and what we do want to do, we want to compare these two distributions. And as they're both normal distributions with known variants, that's really a question of comparing mu1 and mu0, for example, though not necessarily by the difference between them. So in that simple case, we know that there's a causal parameter, the effect of treatment, and it's a function of two dis different distributions. It's a function of P1 and P0, and in this case, we're just comparing the means. And I point out that uh, all we need to do is to think of these two different distributions. Uh, we know how to make inference about the, the effect of treatment. We can, we can do tests. We can use the t-statistic in all sorts of clever ways. And one point I'd like you to ponder right now is why haven't I mentioned potential responses? Here we have a causal problem. What is the effect of treatment? Uh, I have 
uh, a quantity I'm talking about, which is the effect of treatment, which is a comparison of the two different distributions. But somehow I managed to do that without talking about potential responses. If I could do that in this simple case, would I really need to elaborate by introducing a completely novel concept when I go to slightly more complicated concepts? So let's uh, recap, uh, and this is statistics uh, 102 perhaps, Bayesian decision theory. Um, I have to make a decision. I have a headache, should I take aspirin or should I just stick with chalk tablets? Uh, what should I think about? Bayesian decision theory says, I think about hypothetically taking either action and thinking about what is likely to happen to me if I do. There will be uh, an unknown future in either case, and I'm uncertain about what it is. So I think about my consequence and uh, I assess its distribution. I'm uncertain about it. And as a good Bayesian, I have uh, a distribution uh, expressing my epistemic uncertainty about what's going to happen. In particular, how long my, on a, on a long scale, my headache is going to last. So I think about this and I assess two different distributions. Uh, if I'm going to take the aspirin, I equals one. I think what distribution I'm going to get for my log uh, headache um, episode. And likewise, I can assess P0 if I were to take the chalk tablets. And I can set this out in a very traditional decision tree where we have uh, a beginning node, new star, which is where I make a decision. So there's a decision node. One is active treatment, aspirin. Uh, and if I do that, I'm going to arrive at this random node, new one, where there will be an uncertain future, an uncertain outcome, why, any of these things. But, and whether I regard it, uh, uh, nature as being objective or my own epistemic uncertainty, I regard there will be a distribution over the various ways I can leave this node and end up with a particular value of, the, uh, uh, of my outcome. And I might have a loss function, which measures what I feel, how, how bad that will be. And exactly in parallel, I can consider what would happen if I were to take the chalk tablets, I would, move to this node new zero where I now assess a different future, different distribution over what's going to happen to my headache. So really all I've got here, the, the, the ingredients in order to populate the decision tree are two distributions, P0 and P1, and the specification of my loss function. That's all I need. Uh, and how do I solve this? Uh, Bayesian decision theory says I take, I'm, I minimize my expected loss. So I calculate my expected loss here and I calculate my expected loss here and I choose the action which minimizes it. Uh, so if I take P, uh, uh, treatment one, I get this expected loss, treatment zero, I get this expected loss. And that's, uh, if, if this is the better, then that's what I should do, take aspirin. Uh, and I know that no matter what the loss function may be, the only thing I need in order to uh, decide what to do is the pair of distributions, P0 and P1. I call them hypothetical distributions. There's nothing hypothetical about them. They're ver perfectly well-defined, but they relate to the hypotheses I'm entertaining. So P1 is valid under the hypothesis that I will take active treatment one. And likewise, P0 is what's relevant under the hypothesis that I will take treatment zero. Right. Uh, so let's move on to uh, causal inference from this point of view. Um, so I think causal inference is really trying to learn from available data about what P0 and P1 should be. Uh, so it's assisted uh, uh, Bayesian inference, if you like, assisted Bayesian decision theory. Um, now, in this particular case where I had a simple experimental setup, um, I had my um, treated group and uh, let's imagine that uh, I regard myself as similar to those 
in the treaty group. So if I do, well, sorry, it's similar to those in the experiment. So if I do take aspirin, I'll now be similar to those in the experiment who took aspirin. So hypothetically, uh, my result would be similar to what the actual result was of those who did take aspirin. Uh, so I'd regard my response as being this normal distribution, which was what those in the treaty group uh, what, what, what control their response. And exactly the same way, I can hypothesize that I don't take the aspirin and then I become really exchangeable with the control group. And in that case, I will have P0, which is uh, N mu zero sigma squared. If I had an awful lot of data, then I could, uh, I could just specify what these were. Now, this is something which I'm not gonna go into much, um, but maybe I haven't got a lot of data. This is something where we have to do inference. Uh, so if I can, what I've got, uh, I've got data and I want to learn my posterior distribution for, for PI. Um, and if we use a Bayesian approach in that particular example, we've got finite data with NI observations on, on, on treatment I and XI bar is their average and mi is a prior mean, and tau i squared is the prior variance. Anyway, there's a formula which tells me what that is based on the data, and I could use those uh, to solve my decision problem. And again, I would just look at the expected loss. Now, the expectation conditional on the data I'm using, therefore, given these conditional distributions, where that's my loss function, it really doesn't matter what my loss function is. Uh, the important thing is to compute these two predictive distributions. And in particular, and for simplicity, we'll assume from now on that we're just taking a linear loss. You just look at the difference of the predictive means. Uh, well, it would be nice to develop that further, but I'm not going to do so. I'm going to just consider the case where we really have lots and lots and lots of data and uh, uncertainty in the data is not an issue. So I can imagine that I can learn P0 and P1 pretty much exactly from the data behind me. Um, so from now on, I'm assuming uh, that the, if you like, the probabilistic structure of the problem is entirely known. And therefore I can I use P1 and P0 and all I need is those two distributions. And uh, with a, I just look at the average causal effect. If this is negative, then, uh, mu one minus mu zero, mu one is less than mu zero, which is good, so I'll take the aspirin. And from now on, I'll just assume that. Um, so some comments on this. Uh, I said, well, potential responses simply don't turn up. We don't have uh, a jo uh, potential responses, y zero, what will happen if I take chalk, and y one, what will happen if I take aspirin? because then I would need to have two variables with a bivariate distribution. Uh, I don't have two variables with a bivariate distribution. I have two distributions. I only have a single outcome, which is how long my headache's, headache's gonna last. Um, but I got two hypothetical distributions because I'm considering two different hypotheses. Uh, if I were to do uh, potential responses, I'd have to worry about the joint dependence uh, in that distribution, that's not relevant in the decision theoretic approach. Uh, another point to make is that people think you have to worry about the patients in the study, for example, and worry counterfactually. Uh, somebody was treated, what would have happened if that person wouldn't, wasn't treated? Actually, uh, it might be an interesting question philosophically, but re for the purpose of, of uh, this, my, my, my current uh, decision problem is simply irrelevant. And another point to make is that the uh, response uh, Y uh, can be nice and stochastic, even after the point of treatment, it's something which we don't involve in nature. I don't have to imagine a pre-existing uh, potential variable, which will simply be, uh, 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 as it were, unfolded uh, when I take the appropriate treatment. Uh, there's no missing data. This is a very important point. There's something which uh, Paul Ru uh, Holland called the uh, fundamental problem of causal inference, which is from the point of view of uh, 
potential response theory, there's always something missing, and that's a problem. Uh, but that's not a fundamental problem for causal inference. That's a fundamental problem of potential response theory. There is no missing data in this particular approach. Uh, and another uh, point to make is that I'm defining the average causal effect as the difference of the two hypothetical expectations, two distributions for the same variable and the difference of their means. But I'm not thinking about an individual causal effect and taking its expectation. Uh, so what have we got here? Uh, we've got basic Fisherian experimental design ideas. We've got uh, Bayesian standard decision theory and off we go and we can solve our problem and we don't need all this extra valid baggage that everybody says we need to do causal inference. Um, right, well, that's the, the simplest uh, statistics 101 course um, with uh, a purely experimental study. But of course, it gets really interesting when we have observational data and that's what we move to now. So, Assignments of treatments to study subjects was, was done in some way we, we may not have had control over. What can we do with such data? Uh, can, and, and the first question is, can we do what we just said? Treat the data as if they were experimental. Sometimes you can, but rarely. What that will require, again, is if I, would if I were to think of taking treatment T, I would put myself uh, in the treatment group. And if I were to think of treatment C, control chalk, I would put myself in the control group. Uh, notice that um, I can only regard myself as exchangeable with each group separately when those two great control groups are exchangeable with each other, which means I must be comparing like with like. Uh, and that's one reason why observational studies are very problematic because often the two groups are not like with like, and that's what we have to make allowances for. Uh, in the very special case when I can make those assumptions, um, then I would say the treatment assignment is ignorable. Well, let's try and get a bit more formal about all that. Um, so we have a treatment variable, and for simplicity, we'll make it binary still, T. Uh, and a response variable, Y, uh, doesn't matter what it is, but think of it as real valued again. But I'm going to introduce a bit more notation and let's bring in a non-stochastic regime indicator. It's a bit like a parameter which labels distributions. Uh, it doesn't, it's not itself stochastic. It's just a label for distributions. So Ft equals zero labels the hypothetical case where I'm going to take treatment zero so it, obviously what I know about T is it's going to be zero, but what do I know about anything else? Uh, well, I'm uncertain about things like the eventual outcome Y, so there will be a hypothetical distribution for Y. Uh, and likewise, FT equals one says, I'm going to hypothesize taking treatment one, but also I'm, I've got the third uh, so-called idle regime uh, where nature, in, in some way I may or may not have control of, is choosing the treatment in some random way. Now, what do I care about? I care about my two possible actions. I'm either going to take the aspirin or I'm going to take the chalk. That's what I want to compare. The problem is I don't have data from those two circumstances because data from this would involve intervening to force people to take treatment one and likewise force people to take treatment zero. That's not what I've got. I've got my random data. So what the problem becomes is relating the data I do have to the data I would like to have to the problem I want to solve. And that is exactly what, uh, what we're going to do. We want to find a way of using the data to assist me with my decision problem, taking account of the fact that it isn't ideal. It's in an experimental study, it might have been ideal. I could have got directly at these two things. But in an observational study, um, I'm going to have to make some assumptions, and they're typically untestable assumptions, which relate the, the performance of data in this idle regime to the performance of data in the regimes I care about. And then so I need to make and justify 
some connections between these different regimes. Uh, so to go back to the experimental case and ignorability, that's the simplest possible case, but it's typically not a very sensible assumption. Uh, the assumption would be that the distribution of the outcome uh, in the regime where I intervene and, and, and decide to take treatment one is exactly the same as in the regime where nature decides uh, to give me treatment one. Uh, or some, to, to to give the people in the experiment in the, in their study treatment one. Uh, so conditionally in the idle regime on T being equals one, uh, what would I expect to see? In that case, I, it doesn't really matter which regime I'm in. The whether I force treatment one or will I just observe treatment one, doing and seeing in Pearl's notation, they they uh, would be the same. Um, and this is the concept of ignorability and it's quite nice that we have a language to talk about this it says the distribution of y given t equals one is the same no matter whether it's in the regime where i force t equal to v1 or in a different regime where it's given by nature so it says the y actually is independent of the regime given t equals one that's a conditional independent statement um and in the language of conditional independence or the notation, uh, I can write y is independent of ft given t. This is, you read this, y is independent of ft given t. And just one important point about this, y is a random variable. t is a random variable. f of t is a regime indicator. It's a non-random variable. So can I really talk about independence when not all variables are random? The answer is yes, I jolly well can. Uh, and what I mean when I write that down is exactly what I've said in words here. Uh, and it's a perfectly sensible thing to say, and it's perfectly uh, mathematically proper to write it in the same way, and indeed to manipulate conditional independence statements of this kind as if everything were random. I also have a graphical representation uh, of these three variables, which, in, which is the simple graphical model of that conditional independent statement. The lack of an arrow from ft, which is a square because it's a decision node, the lack of an arrow from ft to y is exactly the graphical representation of this conditional independence property. So what I've got now is representing my causal assumptions by relationships between different regimes, and those relationships are often uh, very clearly expressed in terms of conditional independence algebra or their corresponding graphical representations. Now, I said this is a very special case which we typically wouldn't believe because we believe there could be confounding variables. Um, so if I made those assumptions, I'd have a lot of justification to do. Maybe I could, maybe I couldn't. Uh, but typically we would have confounding. So let's think about confounding. Um, so when that condition of ignorability fails, what can I do? Well, it might be okay if I condition on additional information and I could restore it. Uh, so let's consider a variable U, an, an observed variable. Um, some people like to call this a confounder. I think that's a terrible name for it. I call it a sufficient covariance. Uh, what happens is we've got another variable. What does this mean? U is independent of it. That means it has the same distribution. It, it has a, it's out there. It has a distribution irrespective of what decision I take or what, what, does, what nature does. It's just out there. Uh, and that's represented in this picture by the lack of an arrow between FT and U. There's also no arrow between ft and y in this picture, and that represents the conditional independence relationship that given t and u, y is independent of ft. That means that as long as I know what treatment I got and the additional information in u, I don't care how I got the treatment. So the important thing about this notation and this uh, uh, augmented DAG, as I like to call it, is that we distinguish between uh, the treatment you've got and how you got the treatment. So T is the treatment you've got and FT is how you got the treatment. And this says, it doesn't matter how you got the treatment. If I know T and U, that's all I need to, to know to predict Y. Um, 
And if I believe that, then I can easily estimate the average causal effect. Uh, uh, and this is the backdoor formula, if you like, the G formula. Um, what I do is I, first of all, condition on you. So if I condition on you, I'm basically back to the previous completely ignorable situation and I get my conditional or so-called specific causal effect, which is a function of the variable U. Uh, and it just, uh, because, because uh, I don't care about what decision variable I've got here, I, might, I can do it in the idle regime with the data I've actually got. And it's sort of just a comparison of two observational conditional expectations and becomes a function of U. And then if I now take my average of that, again, in the idle regime, then I get the average causal effect. And because all the computations are done in the idle regime, they can be done using the data I've got from the uh, observational experiment. Uh, yeah. Uh, now this is fine as long as I observe you. Uh, there's a problem if I don't observe you. If I don't observe this sufficient covariate, I have a situation of confounding. You isn't the confounder, you is the unconfounder, because when I know it, there's no confounding. Please don't call it a confounder. Uh, now, I've got a number of other topics I, I, I can cover. I, I should go on for, I guess, another 15 minutes to talk about how we can use this in, in, in different cases. But uh, I might change the order and maybe leave some out. So let me just see um, if I can cleverly do this. That's the wrong one, not very clever. That wasn't very clever either. Okay, well, uh, there's a way to do this. Go to page, let's try 92. Okay, good. There's something, there's a topic, uh, a concept called effective treatment on the treated. Uh, and you ask, given in the observational experiment, not uh, people were treated maybe for some reason, depending on their health. Um, and you're interested in maybe how would those people have responded if they'd been untreated? What's the effect of treatment on those who actually got the treatment? So let me think that I'd been in the study, I would have been exchangeable with those who got the treatment. Uh, should I take the treatment? So I regard myself as suitable for treatment. And, and a, a very helpful thing is to make a distinction between being suitable for treatment and uh, getting the treatment. So in the observational study, you can regard it as two stages. The individuals in the study were first of all fingered as being suitable or unsuitable for treatment, uh, perhaps on the basis of, uh, of their, their, their health and various other characteristics. And then the treatment was applied according to their suitability. Those treated, those regarded as suitable were treated, those regarded as unsuitable were not treated. I'm in a different situation. I am suitable for treatment, but I still have the choice as to whether I take treatment or not. Um, so what I care about is the, the what I call the untreatable. I, I, I've been regarded as being suitable for treatment, but I haven't yet been treated. So what I care about is my expected response, given that I'm suitable for treatment, if I were to take T equals one, uh, my, uh, compare that with if I were to take T equals zero. I could uh, regard this uh, as either observational or, or, or interventional. Uh, and it's, I can intervate, I, I can obviously estimate the first term because in the treated group, I had people who were both regarded as suitable for treatment and actually got the treatment. So I can just do that. There's a something slightly problematic about this. Here I want to know what would happen to people who were regarded as suitable for treatment, but didn't get it. And the real problem is I don't have any such people in my study. They all, those who were suitable all got treatment, treated. And it turned, you think that we can't actually estimate this. And uh, I thought for a long time you couldn't estimate this. I had a research student who uh, proved me wrong, which was very nice. Uh, and you can actually show a formula for this, uh, which is simply using the different uh, regimes. It depends on the, uh, the overall expected uh, response among those in the study. 
uh, this is the probability, this is a propensity score for those in the study, those who get treatment one. Um, and this involves those, th this is uh, something which involves a, a group of controlled patients uh, who are forced not to take the active treatment, and we look at those. So I'd need to have, as well as the observational data, from which I get these two terms, I would need to have a control group in order to compute that. It turns out I don't always need that either. Um, as long as I can observe a sufficient covariate, uh, there's another formula and I can get it there. And it doesn't matter which, the sufficient covariates aren't necessarily unique, by any means, uh, and it doesn't matter which one I use, I will always get that. Uh, and this cuts us a little bit close to the potential response definition. The potential response definition of effective treatment on the treated is compare the individual causal effect, if you like, y1 minus y0, take its expectation conditional on t equals one. Um, in the observational regime, because that's all you have, and uh, I simply replace the individual causal effect by the specific causal effect given a, a, a sufficient covariate. And, and it doesn't matter which of these you do because you'll get the same answer in all cases. Can I throw in a question? Sure. Is that, I mean, the top ETT doesn't, that looks like a, you're using the propensity score again. So is, is, it, is it a non-Bayesian estimator again? Well, I'm not, I, uh, this is a formula, assuming I, there are no unknown probabilities. I'm assuming all probabilities can be computed from extensive data. So we're not actually doing estimation, we're doing computation. Okay. Does that answer your question? Sure. Yeah, I mean, so obviously if we had finite data, um, then issues of, of uh, estimation w w would rise to the fore. Um, but I don't think that's probably this is I say it's a potential for it's, it's just it really all this is is the is the proportion of people in the observational study who got the treatment so so I would to call it a propensity score is actually a bit high flown okay um, then uh, other topics we can talk about um, let's go on to oh yeah that, that's just an aside of no great importance you'd think you'd need to know the outcome for treated patients, but in fact, it turns out it's not part of the formula. Uh, let's go to another problem. So this is a problem which uh, uh, Jamie Robbins did a lot of wonderful uh, foundational work on when we have sequential decisions. Or, so let's consider the case where uh, there's a variable L1, which is observed, following which a treatment one is applied, uh, then an, an interim outcome, L2, uh, followed by a further treatment T2, followed by a, a final outcome Y, and each of these can take account of everything that went before. Okay, so that's what I just said. Right. Um, now what I care about is what would happen if I were to, to have a particular plan for how to treat patients. So, Imagine the hospital wants to know how to treat patients uh, and they contemplate one or, or many for that matter, but let's just stick to one at a time, a contemplated protocol. So what they would do, there's a particular way of choosing T1 in the light of L1. So T1 as a function of L1, although it could be randomized as well, that's not a problem. Um, and then we observe L2, and then part of the strategy would also to say how T2 should be decided, but that also is allowed to depend on everything that's gone before. And I want to see what would I expect to get if I applied that pr procedure. Um, now I don't, I haven't actually done that. I've got data, but my data is observational. And in my observational data, this procedure was not followed. So can I use my observational data? And once again, I've got to relate different regimes. Um, now I'm, one of my regimes is the protocol I'm considering, S, and the other I just call O for the observational data I've got. And so we have a non-stochastic regime indicator, which has the two possible values. And the question we want to ask 
question we want to answer. Can we evaluate the uh, expected response you would get if you carried out this protocol from the observational data? Um, and the answer is yes, if you're willing to make some fairly strong assumptions. So those strong assumptions which relate the different regimes together are summarized in that diagram. And that diagram is itself a summary of a number of algebraic relationships. Uh, the lack of arrows uh, from sigma to L1 says that it says that the first uh, thing you observe that well, you're not going to take your do your protocol till after you've observed it. So that's independent of, uh, 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 of which regime you're talking about. The lack of an arrow from sigma to L2 says that once you know the, the first uh, measured value and the first treatment that was given, uh, how the next um, intermediate outcome turns out will only depend on those values and it will be the same in the observational and the um, interventional protocol uh, and similarly for Y. So if you can assume those, and those, that's a big ask, but let's assume you can assume, then we can get Robin's G formula very simply. Uh, and here's how it is. I want, I can get the joint distribution of all variables. Uh, first of all, I just do the, 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 write it down as a sequence of conditional distributions. Uh, I notice that by the assumptions I've made, I can interchange the uh, S and O here, that's observational, and I can do it again here in the third term, and I can do it again in the fifth term, because I have three assumptions which allow me to do that. What about the second and the fourth terms? Well, I've got a protocol which tells me how T1 depends on L1. I've got a protocol that tells me how T2 depends on those things. So once I apply those protocols, I know exactly what these terms are. And uh, if I just take this joint distribution and marginalize, I can find what I want. And that essentially is Robin's G formula. And I should wind up pretty shortly, but I'll just point out that if you were to take uh, the original potential response approach to this, you'd need to think of potential versions of all the variables under either regime. And all these 10 variables would be, have to have a joint distribution. Uh, which is a lot to think about. Uh, and there are a lot of constraints on that distribution, consistency constraints and sequential ignorability constraints. I won't go into it. Oh, I just um, hope that by flashing that up at you, I've persuaded you that my method may be slightly simpler. Uh, I'm not gonna go through instrumental variable because my time is running out. I will skip to my summary slide, which is, on. Let's do that. So I've been trying to persuade you that causal inference isn't anything very special. It's really just decision theory. And I want to know how to assist my decision making by using available data. And uh, it's traditional statistical tools, straightforward distributional theory and uh, extended a little bit by uh, introducing decision variables, uh, but that's traditional too, that's fine. Um, I don't see any need for potential responses. Uh, and uh, I, I've got various cases where I, I, I won't go into, but I regard them as actually potentially misleading. And I think uh, th th I regard a lot of the analysis in, in statistical causality is falling into two groups. One where it's fine, it's good, it's used potential responses, but by goodness, they could have done it more easily. Um, and perhaps next time you think of doing that, you might find out if you could do it more easily. And there's another group where I, they, I, I, I would put in the potentially misleading ca uh, um, camp. Uh, at which point I will say, thank you very much for your attention. And I'll take questions if you have any, but I will stop my share. Are there any questions? I can start with, I, I see two parts of controversy here actually, at least. So one is that you, you, your original problem with like aspirin, no aspirin, and you said, okay, I have a lot of data here. I've got like P1, P2, or P, sorry, P0, P1. But I think if, um, uh, 
if I, th I think if I map it to um, Larry's formulation, we have a context, we're doing personalized med medicine, we have, we have an X, we, um, and we have many drugs that we're going to give to people. And you, you didn't really cover this, but it's, it's whether you should use a propensity score or not, whether, whether you need to leave Bayes or not, it seems to be one path of controversy here. Were you convinced by the argument that you should? Um, I said the, what I've been talking about is pretty much orthogonal to what Larry was talking about because I haven't been discussing estimation at all. As I said, I'm assuming that all, all unknown quantities are in fact knowable uh, because you've got lots of data. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I am intrigued by the, the Robbins Ritoff arguments and, uh, and Larry's excellent presentation of them. I haven't come to a settled view of it. Um, and uh, I think, as I say, it lives in a slightly uh, different uh, ballpark from, from what I was discussing, which is trying to get the foundations right. Uh, Larry did introduce some um, potential responses, but, but they were completely um, ir irrelevant to the rest of his argument. Yeah, it's true. It wasn't your, it wasn't your main topic, but uh, yeah, yeah, you, okay. Yeah, very diplomatic, but uh, in, interesting. Uh, I think the other thing that, that Perlian type people might say to this is that actually I need to do non-Bayesian manipulations. I need to, with the problems like collider bias and complicated problems like this, um, then Bayesian manipulations, I need to use the do calculus and it doesn't look like probability theory. Um, and it oh, it's, can... Sorry, can I, if I can come back to it, it isn't probability theory, it's, it's decision theory. The do calculus uh, is absolutely part of this approach. Uh, all it involves is variables and interventions. Um, yeah, it's the, it's the same. It's equivalent to the uh, intervention node. Yeah. Right. So this the do calculus can actually the, the rules of the do calculus can very simply be justified um, in, by in terms of this approach. Yeah, that's that's how you the derived them in nine ninety three. With, with the F nodes and the idle yeah. regime and the zero and the one. In, in, you yeah. derived them where? Uh, in 1993. I think Carlos was, remembers better than I do where oh. I derived them. <laughs> it's, a, it's a UAI paper, I think. Uh, so uh, I, have a, I have a question. No, so I guess, David, uh, we can go back to this on the, or the other Please. David. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm actually answered the, not Philip, but the... <laughs> Because I think you're conflating estimation with identification. Uh, so, so what Philip was discussing doesn't involve Bayes' theorem at all. Uh, he's, he, he's considering that he has all the data. Right? And the problem that Larry was discussing is, is of the estimation part, not, not of the... I mean, I think you know, they're, they're, they're both important problems, but, uh, and, and, and they really should be brought together, of course, because I mean, estimation uh, with finite data would be an, an important, well, I mean, I, I briefly expressed how you would do it, but um, yeah. Um, uh, so, but, but I have a question for you, Philip. Sure. So, uh, yeah, so one thing that like, so, okay, so you are introducing new notation because you have the, the intervention uh, nodes, right? And the intervention knows they have a logic too, which is extra statistical because you, you need to say what the intervention nodes are, what the interventions mean, uh, how they modify the system like uh, via context, context specific independencies. So for me, this is extra, right? Like this is the causal inference part. So I don't know why you're, you're saying, oh, this is not causal inference. So it's, I don't know if it's a question. Oh, no, on the contrary, I'm saying this is what causal inference is. <clears throat> it is cool. Of course it's causal inference. And, 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 and uh, all manipulations on graphs and things are all part of it. And, 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 and a lot, another part of it, and, and for that, what I would like to really emphasize um, is, is that really most of the work should go into justifying the assumptions that you're making, which might be represented in a graph, but you have to justify it. Yeah, so, so I guess on that part, I, I, I have a follow-up question, which is, uh, so I read your paper too uh, on JCI, which I think it's the uh, the basis of the talk. Uh, and I guess the paper addresses a little bit of this, but not in the presentation. Because, for example, in the presentation, you you were you had on slide. Let's pick the. Uh, well, now I forgot the slide number. 
but you had the conditional independence, like Y independent of the intervention node given T. And mm -hmm. it seemed to me that your focus is more on the conditional independence itself and not on the meaning of the arrows. Uh, but for example, uh, I think it's light 11, for example. Let me see if I can uh, get it. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, this isn't as easy as it should be. Slide eleven. Yes, I think so. That's a, uh, slide eleven is not page number eleven. Oh, oh yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I don't know the page number. <laughs> no, no, no. This is this is not as easy as it should be. However, we will see what we can do. I think, is that what you meant? Yeah, this yeah. one, yeah. So for example, I could flip all the arrows yes. and would still have the same conditional independence, right? Now you in the paper, you, no, you, 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 you justify- you can't, flip the arrow. you can't flip an arrow out of a decision. Arrows from decision nodes are meaningless. They can't point in, they, they point out. No, okay, but that's, a, that's an extra statistical rule, right? So, so I'm saying you have to have something beyond that conditional independence to justify uh, the direction of, of things. Well, I mean, I mean, there is no direction, actually. They, well, you don't need a picture. You just need the algebra. Y is independent of FT given T. Forget the picture. This is what does it. No, OK, but the thing is, and, and, if, yes, and, if, you, and if you represented it with the arrows going the other way, it would still say Y is independent of FT given T. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. But the, so, so I'm asking that because usually the, tra the type of reasoning we do is, is not I have then independence that I want to represent, but I, I, I think about local mechanisms and then I derive the independence from those local mechanisms. And that's why every, every arrow has a meaning. Of, of causation, which I think you dislike because it's, it's too strong to attach a meaning yeah. to every arrow. But, sure. but, the, but, but that's what guides us to, to put the direction of the arrow. And then well, here I it seems- actually, I, would, I, would, I would negate what you said. I would, you said every arrow has a meaning or maybe some arrow. I would say no arrow has a meaning. No arrow in the picture has a meaning whatsoever. The only things that have meaning are the missing arrows which represent conditional independences. And the conditional oh, independences okay. are exactly what you need to do the causal reasoning. Now, the individual uh, never interpret an arrow as causal. An arrow is not a causal thing. It's the conditional independence represented by the applying moral, uh, uh, the um, just looking at, 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 at interpreting conditional independences as if these are all random variables. That's all you need, and it doesn't it doesn't matter where the arrows go. They you can you can turn them around. The, the arrows are not causal. It's the in conditional independences that are causal. It, but it seems to me we would never discover colliders thinking like this because we wouldn't think about it's a pretreatment, but it's caused by two and independent. Um, because it, it's not leading us to think about this threat of, uh, for example, oh, should I condition on this variable to be, uh, what types of variables would be your sufficient covariate U, right? Well, and then who, what knows? I, who knows? Who knows? I mean, this is a question about the world. It's not a question about your graph. No, exactly. So, so suppose I know the world and I can represent it in a graph. Can I, can I decide whether I should condition on some of the variables? So it's a separate question of whether my knowledge of the world is correct. But I mean, like we should be able to answer okay. if we had the okay. There is, I mean, everything that Pearl does with his uh, causal graphs with do calculus and things like that and deciding what the condition, everything is, 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 is unchanged. It all comes out of this. Uh, what this does, I think, is, is, is to make the logic of it and sometimes the, the development of it a bit clearer. So all of that is the same. Nothing changes. I think the panel is going to be really fun. <laughs> well, can we can we uh, maybe move on to the next one and maybe even Finn will shed some lights on. But thanks so much for that. It was a again really provocative and really interesting, and it's it's been uh, great to have you. And I'm sorry I'm the only one clapping the way it works here, but uh, thanks again. <laughs> um, Finn, 